A common geophysical method uh, used for investigating the subsurface is uh, referred to as terrain conductivity. Um, and, you know, there, there, there are lots of different uh, electromagnetic methods. The terrain conductivity approach that we're going to talk about is an electromagnetic induction approach. And, um, <clears throat> and the reason that it's important is that, and that we might want to use it, is because it does tell us something about the conductivities of layers in the uh, subsurface. So just as a, a kind of a general re reminder of how electromagnetic induction works, you can probably remember back to your basic physics experiment there where you have a, a coil of wire hooked up to an ammeter and uh, you, you pass a magnet through the coil of wire and you notice that there's a current that's uh, generated. And as you go back and forth, the uh, direction of current flow changes. So depending on which way you're uh, passing the magnet through the, um, through the coil. <clears throat> so when the, cat, when the magnet is moving, you get current flow. When the uh, magnet stops, the current stops. So we, we know that this um, varying magnetic field produces a uh, variable current flow. Which, which in turn induces its own uh, uh, electromagnetic field, and that's that's the phenomena that we're taking advantage of when we run terrain conductivity uh, electromagnetic induction surveys. So, if we take a look at this example here, and I, you know I put put some um, um, uh, web links down here. Just to, this is this is an interesting example that comes from the link below. Uh, if we have a coil of wire around a, a, you know, a solenoid and we have a ring which is closed uh, around this, this rod and as we're running current through the coil, what do we know happens in this ring? What's happening in that ring? Well, we know that a current is going to be, current flow is going to be induced in this the electrons are going to start flowing in this ring, but they're going to flow in the opposite direction. So if we're looking down on this coil here, we can see that the current is flowing counterclockwise. The current or the electrons in this um, ring are going to be flowing clockwise. So they're going to we're going to have an induced magnetic field which opposes the magnetic field produced by electron flow in this coil. So we expect the ring to fly off. So if we cut the ring, <clears throat> well, what would happen? Well, uh, we don't have a, you know, we don't have a completed circuit. We can't get electron flow through the ring, so nothing happens. Um, and less electrons can flow through this uh, circuit. Uh, it, there won't be any induced electromagnetic field. Uh, now, here's something that uh, you might think about, and this would be something that you would probably wouldn't want to try at home, but given what we see over here, we have an electromagnetic field that's induced by a uh, flow of <clears throat> flow of electrons through the coil. We know that in the can we're going to get electrons flowing in the opposite direction, that's going to produce a torque, a twisting. We're going to basically crush the can of Coke. So you might wonder, if you are going to do this, use an empty can of Coke. So, so those are kind of basic uh, cartoon ref kind of reminders of what electromagnetic induction is. Uh, when you're collecting terrain conductivity data, there are lots of different instruments that you'll come across in the literature that will be available uh, from companies that you might search out on the internet and so on. Two instruments that are commonly used are referred to as the EM31 and the EM34. And these instruments are manufactured by a company called Geonics. <clears throat> and they're they're commonly used because they're simple to operate 
and they provide very useful data. So you'll notice that the EM31 is uh, something that a single individual can can use to collect data, and the EM34 on the other hand requires usually requires two people. So you've got a transmitter coil and a receiver coil. Transmitter and receiver coil are in this um, mast uh, here. So we've got transmitter coil on one end, the receiver coil on the other. So some examples of um, <clears throat> terrain conductivity applications. So here we are out in the San Juan Basin, which is in the northwestern corner of New Mexico. This is a mesa, and there are just lots of mesas in the area. The canyons are about 200, 300 feet deep, and then you get these nice uh, flat mesa tops that uh, can't really see the topography in. Just a little hint of the relief here as we come up into these canyons. This is another type of electromagnetic uh, <clears throat> terrain conductivity instrumentation. It's manufactured by another company called Geofex. This particular instrument is referred to as the GEM2. And again, you have a transmitter in one end and a receiver in the other end. And <clears throat> these, these, um, um, this instrument here, you can go along at a walking pace. It uh, collects multi-frequency data, so it'll collect data at a variety of different frequencies as you're as you're walking. So the area that we have covered here was collected over a mesa and you can see the, the blues represent lower conductivity, the, uh, the reds and the oranges represent higher conductivity. And the reason we were interested in collecting this data here was to see where there's a CO2 injection well over here and we were wondering, well, okay, if CO2 did escape back toward the surface, where would we likely uh, see it? And we would likely see it in these uh, low conductivity areas, which tend to be more porous and permeable and well-drained areas on the, on the mesa. Uh, a little bit of background on the project. There were several different kinds of geophysical experiments that were conducted on the site. We had uh, <clears throat> the electromagnetic survey. We also had tracers and soil, soil gas monitors. We had vertical seismic profiles. We actually had 3D seismic data over the area. We have tilt meters, um, all designed to see what would happen as CO2 was injected into a deeper formation in this, uh, in this area. And of course, a lot of the work that was done here was to see, okay, well, if we did, you know, if we are we are injecting CO2, uh, if it does escape, where might we position our tracers to, uh, where might we expect to see CO2 come back to the surface? <clears throat> so it's a multidisciplinary effort. Um, another example of this is resistivity, and this is just to point out that resistivity is the reciprocal of conductivity. This is a this is a borehole instrument which can conducts a high resolution resistivity survey on the borehole wall, so that we can see the fine details of sedimentation. In this case, interdune, dune, interdune, appearing in the microimaging uh, log. And we can also see things like uh, fractures, which are uh, important and would be important to see in a carbon sequestration application. So here are some examples of fractures that were observed in this uh, micro uh, <clears throat> microimaging log. These are some rose diagrams that show their orientation. In this case, these are induced fractures, so we know that uh, uh, SH min is in this direction, SH max in this direction here. Uh, another example is an application used to, of terrain conductivity used to locate abandoned wells. If we're injecting CO2 as we were in this area here, these are laterals that were drilled into coal seams in the subsurface. 
we <clears throat> want to make sure that any injected CO2 doesn't escape to the surface through old wells. So can we find these old wells? This particular well we were unable to find. Um, and uh, we thought, well, okay, terrain conductivity might be a good way to locate that. This was the projected location of that well was uh, over here. We didn't really find any abandoned well there. We have a tracer sampler, which is located over here. What we did find when we ran the terrain conductivity survey was that, well, uh, we couldn't find, a, couldn't find the well, uh, but it did look like a good technique to map the subsurface uh, geology in this area. So we could kind of see the subcrop of, um, of uh, geologic units in, in the subsurface. So um, didn't pursue that any further. We didn't actually find the, uh, find the well. We didn't find any leakage. But, um, you know, not, not to be deterred uh, by our sophisticated uh, approach here with terrain conductivity, we decide, well, let's take a look at some old um, aerial photography. So just taking a look at an old uh, black and white uh, 1934 aerial photo, we did find something over here that looked very much like a well pad uh, with a um, well located on it. Uh, we did tell the owner about this. The owner has a house over here, and he didn't seem to be too concerned. I think today this is a garden area, and uh, <clears throat> to our knowledge, no CO2 ever made its way to the to the surface there. So this is just kind of a brief introduction of well, this is you know very generally what terrain conductivity is what it does, why you might want to use it, some examples. Um, some recommended reading would be this uh, technical report, which is um, available on the Geonics website. Uh, also, Berger, Sheehan, and Jones have a uh, good book on exploration geophysics. I think their chapter 8 uh, covers some background information on terrain conductivity applications as well. So I would just uh, refer you to that literature, and we'll continue on with our discussions of terrain conductivity. Um, next time around, we'll talk about um, oh, the operation of these instruments at low induction number, what is low induction number, um, what is skin depth, uh, talk about some additional concepts in terrain conductivity, electromagnetic uh, induction methods. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you next time.